I'm Linda Manning. As Katie said, I'm the city clerk of the city of Aspen. So today's um, discussion, we are going to focus mostly on municipal elections, not state or county. I just wanted to make that clear. So Aspen is governed by state statutes, our home rule charter, and our election rules. Those are defined by our election commission, which is comprised of myself and two members that are appointed by our city council. So who is this presentation geared to? If I could get a show of hands, is there anybody in the audience who is responsible for elections? Anybody out there? Okay, there's a few of you. Keep your hands up. Of those of you, anybody who deals with mail ballot elections? And then signature verification with your mail ballot. Okay, we have a couple of you. So who else could gain from this presentation? We have municipal clerks and election staff, laser fish administrators, IT management and support. So some other things to think about, who managed the voter registration list for those elections? It's the state, could be the county, it's also you. Does your state or local rules allow for online registration, election day registration, and signature verification? So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to give you a little bit of background on Aspen elections, the process before, some of our challenges, why we chose laser fish, the process after, some lessons that we learned, we're going to have some time for questions, and then talk about some resources. So about Aspen elections. Like I said, we are governed by state statutes and our home rule charter. Our election commission defines the procedures and audits our election results. Our election rules that the commission defines, it's a 90-page document just about our city election procedures. That document is a living, breathing document that changes constantly based upon the election rules that the state gives us that change pretty regularly. In 2015, our general election was in May. We did have a runoff election that followed quickly behind it in June. Our May election was May 5th. May 7th, we had to have our runoff mailing list to our vendors so they could print the ballots and get them in the mail. Our elections happen every two years. For a runoff election to occur, we usually have them for candidates and races. For it not to occur, a winner must win by 45% plus one vote. So we usually have a runoff election. <laughs> it's rare that we don't have a runoff election. We have five types of ballots. There's a mail ballot, polling place, absentee, special absentee, so a voter can have a ballot emailed to them, and provisional ballots. Our city is divided into six precincts. We have approximately 6,200 registered voters. Turnout is typically 35 to 40 percent, or 22 to 2,500 voters. This election was our first mail ballot election and we were only two votes shy of a record turnout. So we were pretty excited about that. So our process before Laserfish. Today we're only going to focus on the processes supporting the management of voter information and the voted ballots that were returned, not the casting and tabulation of ballots. For that, we utilized our existing software and equipment. On the voter management side, so for A, the printed registration list from the county clerk's office used to confirm you know, if a voter was eligible to vote. We had three polling places to support our six precincts. The judges used the printed registration list to determine if a voter was at the correct polling place. If the voter was at the wrong polling place, in order to vote, they would have to go to the correct polling place. For B, those printed certificates of registration were provided by the county clerk and presented by the voter at the voting center. So the new voters would register at the county clerk's office, they would take that certificate and then they would go to the polling place. That worked out great if they actually took that certificate to the vote center to vote, but a lot of times they wouldn't. So they didn't have that. Those election judges would have to get on the phone, call the county clerk's office, 
This resulted in lots of back and forth phone calls from those judges to the county clerks. County clerk's office had a lot of other things to do than support us on election day, prior to election day. So sometimes it worked out great, sometimes it didn't. <laughs> so that takes us to number C. So the judges will call on the clerks to confirm those newly registered. Voters could also register to vote online. You know, they, they could do that. This year, they could register on the same day. So they're registering on their smartphone as they're waiting in line, thinking this is great. Well, that's great, but our judges didn't have Wi-Fi, you know? They didn't have, <laughs> sorry, we couldn't, couldn't check their registration. Guess what they had to do? Get on the phones of the county. All right, here, another phone call. Moved from one precinct to another. Another phone call. Got married, my last name changed. Oops, another phone call. All, all of this is multiple phone calls, back and forth. <laughs> Moving now to the ballot receipt processing size, side. The judges would utilize a handwritten poll book to capture who voted, when they voted, how they voted. We did signature verification. So the county would provide a list of voter signatures to verify who the voter was, and then the county clerk would help, they helped us in this, because we didn't have access to the state system, so we had to rely on the county clerk to help us. <clears throat> we had 12 handwritten logs that were used for various ballot processes. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Those logs were then re-entered into our master polling spreadsheet. You're gonna hear me refer a lot to this in our next slide. <clears throat> okay, this is where the fun begins. So as I said, new voters would register at the county clerk's office and come to our office to vote, but they wouldn't bring those certificates of registration. The election judges would have to call the county to verify the voter's registration status prior to voting. We had a two-week early voting registration period, and we would also have registration updates coming in from the county clerk's office. All of this would be manual updates into our master polling spreadsheet. That's that little spreadsheet on the right-hand side. Keep that in mind. That's our MPS, master polling spreadsheet. Okay. In-person early voting was also going on, and this would generate spoiled ballots and absentee ballots, both of which needed logged. While early voting was happening, we were also receiving mail ballots from our permanent mail-in voter list. And these were being processed by our election judges. This is happening in that center square. Here, these judges ran into everything from missing signatures, unverified signatures, ballot number discrepancies, mismarked ballots, undeliverable ballots that were being returned to us by the post office, and this is just to name a few things. And guess what? These needed to be logged too. These logs were then gathered up at the end of the day, and then usually at some point into the wee hours of the evening, they were entered into the master polling spreadsheet. Guess who had the honor of doing this? <laughs> Fast forward to election day. The master polling spreadsheet now needed separated into precincts. We had six precincts. This these individual spreadsheets would then be delivered to the appropriate polling place. Because remember, you had to vote at your specific polling place, and if you weren't on that list, you had to be sent to your correct polling place. Because we didn't have a live system, so if I went to the wrong polling place and my name wasn't on that list, the judge had to figure out where you lived, send you to the correct polling place so you were on the right list. So the gist of the story is, Paper is not able to portray that real-time updates to the voter information system and the multiple hand entry of information just makes the risk of errors way too high. Not yet. The most up-to-date information, <laughs> I'm not done, <laughs> was at the end of the day when the master polling spreadsheet was updated. But even that was not truly up-to-date because it didn't include the ballots that were received at the, you know, during that day and weren't opened yet by those judges. We were able to make this work for previous election, but recent decisions and changes by city council in 2015 wouldn't allow us to be successful because of the, the need for real-time data. Now we can go. <laughs> okay, so needless to say, we had quite a few challenges. 
The voter registration system is owned by the state and managed by the county clerk. We had virtually no access to the system that they used, but they did give us minimal election day access this year for one user. Voter registration changed constantly, online and in person. Aspen is a resort town with high residential turnover, 20% plus annually, and we have a very large number of second homeowners. There are ever-changing statutory obligations. There was a 2013 bill allowing for same-day voter registration. Polling places are based on precincts, and they were replaced with vote centers, which allowed any voter to be able to vote at any vote center. This was the city's first mail ballot election, which our city council decided on. We had multiple avenues for ballot submissions. You could mail them in, you could drop them off, you could vote early, you could email them in if you were special, and you could vote in person on election day. <laughs> we have a very well-informed well electorate. They're cautious. They're methodical, and they are not afraid to challenge procedures. We had a compressed timeline. Mail ballot was determined 10 weeks before we actually mailed the ballots out. The multiple vote centers was determined six weeks before the election. We were no longer precinct-based, and that really reinforced the need for the real-time updates. Real-time registration data was not available. The mail ballot and multiple vote centers essentially mandated the need for our real-time data availability. Again, any voter could vote at any vote center. Signature verification. It's not required by state statute, but Aspen chose to verify signatures as an additional measure to ensure the identity of our voters. Searching and reporting. Do we have what we need to operate and what the candidates and interested parties required? We would have candidates every morning request lists of who voted the previous day. I mean, every day they'd call us with those. The press called every day, who voted the previous day? You know, we needed to be able to give them that information by 9 o'clock that morning. Training a diverse set of judges. Did you know? The national average age of an election judge is 72. <laughs> Keep that in mind. <laughs> Next. Okay. okay. <laughs> so our goal. This one's easy. We wanted a single system solution. We wanted to minimize paper logs and eliminate multiple entry of information. Who's heard this one before? Eliminate paper. Reduce the risk of entry errors. We wanted to provide accessible and searchable voter information. Our judges needed a system to find up-to-date information, not paper lists. We wanted to ensure real-time updates to voter information as well as audit information for all changes. That's a key. We needed real-time updates and then the audit capability. Who changed what and when? And then we needed to implement a solution within the available time frame. We started looking at a solution about three months out, but by the time we determined that Laserfiche was our choice, we had about four weeks to implement it. And our VAR is sitting in the front row, and she can uh, vouch for that. <laughs> okay. So, why did we choose laser feed? Vendors typically used for election processes can only offer partial solutions. They had the electronic poll book, but they couldn't manage the voter information or the issuing of ballots. They were really used to working with counties and not municipalities. The city's clerk's office had been using Laserfiche for quite some time, and we were already familiar with it for records management. Laserfiche met our critical needs of being capable of managing voter information, including the signature and voted ballots. It was able to automate our processes. It saved time. It minimized the risk of data entry errors. Security, we could configure it to our user groups. We had an administrative group, a clerk group, and a judge's group. Auditability, 
It was important for the credibility of running an election and protecting our voter information. Accessibility. It was able to keep it, we were able to keep it on the city network and we were able to configure who could view or manage data to the individual data item level. And it was configurable. The user interface was configured for judges or other user groups. And it was easy for the election judges to become proficient, proficient searching for information. Remember, the average age of an election judge is 72. So, our process after laser fiche. Here we go. <laughs> okay. So, back to the voter information management. Those printed registration lists from the county clerk to confirm who was eligible to vote. No more printed list. It was all in the repository and it was searchable. Those printed certificates of registration from the county clerk's office. The judges would enter that information as a new record into the system prior to the voter voting. They'd come into our office, the county clerk would say, take this with you. And guess what? The voters listened. They'd come over, they'd have that certificate, and we would enter that information into the system. So that cut out those phone calls back and forth. We would get sometime daily updates, and Cindy's going to explain the workflow that we would run to get those updates into our system. Onto the ballot side, the handwritten poll book to capture who voted, that voter information was captured and available real time. Anybody with their laptop, our election judges, our office, it was all in there. As soon as we put a change in, we had it. The county provided list of voter signatures used to verify a voter. Those signatures were available within the database. It was awesome. Those 12 handwritten logs, we had it down to three, and then even those were eventually captured as metadata. Instead of re-entering those logs into the master polling spreadsheet, that was no longer necessary because it was originally in there as metadata. At this point, we're going to switch roles here. Cindy's going to take over. Good morning. Now we're going to discuss a little bit how we actually used uh, Laserfish to implement this. Um, we used one template, the voter information template. And on this template, we captured both the voter information, which you see in the left-hand column, and we were also able to capture ballot processing information, including um, absentee, if a user had requested uh, an absentee ballot, that information could be collected. Again, this was stuff that we would handwrite on logs previously. And then for the ballot information, we have the basic information to know uh, the ballot number, the type of ballot, uh, issuing information, and how it was returned to us and its current status. You'll see I have a times three on there. In the state of Colorado, you get three swings at it. You can try, you can try to vote three times. So um, after the third time, you're, you're done. But uh, you can issue up to three ballots. You only get to count one, but you can swing three times. So, okay. For the voter information processing, um, in order to prepare for the election, we would create a folder um, in Laserfish, and then we would obtain from the county clerk um, a set of signature files, one signature per voter, as well as a spreadsheet of the voter information for the registered voters within the city of Aspen. We would then take those images and load them into Laserfish, and next we would run the initial voter metadata assignment workflow, which would take that information from the spreadsheet and load it into Laserfish for us. Again, this is eliminating a lot of hand keying effort. And then the next step after that would be uh, we had previously sent our ballot vendor a spreadsheet of who was to receive a ballot, a mail ballot. The vendor would print the ballots, mail them out for us, and then they would return that spreadsheet providing back to us the ballot number sent, when it was sent, and the type of ballot that was sent out. We could then use that spreadsheet to run another workflow which would update each individual voter's record with that information of that mail ballot that went out to them. And then periodically, again, we would, because voters can continue to change their registration uh, through up and until election day and through election day, 
we would receive updates from the county clerk and we had a voter registration update workflow that we could run to update that information in our system. Again, eliminating a lot of manual data entry on our side. So here we have a, an image of what a system might typically look like. We would create a folder um, for the election. In this case, we have the 2016 demo folder over on the left, and that's showing up on the right. We would create a for review subfolder in there, and we'll explain what that's going to be used for here in a little bit. And then as you can see here, we have essentially just dragged and dropped those TIFF files into the folder. Each one is named by the voter ID, which is used as a key field for us here. Um, and I do want to stress again, you're not looking at anybody's real voter registration information. This is demo data only, so. And now we're looking at the, um, the workflow for the initial voter metadata assignment. This workflow will go through the repository and for each record, um, it will then go out to the spreadsheet, locate that information on the spreadsheet, and then simply load the metadata into the fields for that particular voter. And you can see here on the right here, you can see the last name and first name that has been captured for those individual voter records. For this particular workflow, we, we already knew the number of TIFF files and we knew the number of records in our voter information from the county clerk, so there wasn't a lot of validation required at that particular level in the, in the workflow itself. And then this slide here simply shows you again, we have at this point now we have an image for each voter, a signature image, and then we also have uh, the data loaded for them in the metadata fields. If we were to use multiple signatures for a voter, that's fine. Um, we just would simply add another page. And so there were times when you might have more than one page if you had multiple signatures. It um, typically takes place, we have um, a separate place, a separate room set up for ballot processing. Uh, we have two kind of judges. We have judges who are working the, the vote centers, and then we have judges who are only taking those mail ballots and processing those. And those are in a separate room um, where they have access to the same data. Um, and again, it's one of those, because we have real-time updates too, we, we're, we're able to capture anybody trying to vote twice on us, trying to be sneaky. So. But this, uh, again, here allows us to just look at the signature. So different types of judges are using different pieces of this um, record that you see. And then this is, here is an example of the workflow that we run to process that information from the spreadsheet you see up there at the top. That's what we get back from our ballot printing vendor. They're going to send us per each voter ID, the ballot number, type, the date, and the issue method. That would actually go, this workflow actually cycles through the repository and for each record it will go out and try to find a matching record. If it finds one, it's first going to check the ballot one number field to see if there is a value in there. If it's empty, it will then take that information from the spreadsheet and load it into the, to the metadata fields and then move on to the next record. If for some reason there is a value in that ballot one number field, it's going to take the entire voter record and move it to that full review folder that we talked about earlier. And then after this workflow is finished, that would give Linda or I the opportunity to go back and take a closer look at this between the spreadsheet and what was in the full review folder and further analysis to kind of see what needed to be done with that particular voter. Yeah, it's just a little slow. <laughs> And then the last workflow we have as far as the voter information is one that would, again, allow us just to update voter information for a particular voter. Um, it would go through the repository, look for a matching record in the spreadsheet that had been provided by the county clerk. And if the, there was a match found, it would just update the record and move on. So no ballot information was updated at this point. So now we'll take a, a little bit closer look at the ballot receipt processing. Ballots are returned to us the, by a couple ways. They can be dropped off in person. Um, they can be received very, uh, via the uh, postal service. And then what we do is we collect those and we place those in batches of 25. 
And then we get to probably one of, the, to me, is maybe the most satisfying and kind of calming thing you get to do in elections is binking them into a spreadsheet and collecting that. So and we'll explain that. <laughs> um, so you, you're collecting the, the ballots. You're putting them in batches of 25. Um, and then you're going to run the, the ballot batch update workflow to update the, our records to show that we actually received a ballot back for that voter. And then after the workflow is complete, we're, again, we're going to check for any unprocessed entries in the spreadsheet. And then we're going to print our batch sheets, which will then physically follow that batch to the ballot processing judges to help them con complete their process. <laughs> there it is. Binking return ballots. This is like a technical term that we use to <laughs> utilize <laughs> a hand scanner um, that we can then, on each of our return envelopes, we have a voter uh, ID in the barcode there. And then binking allows us to scan that voter ID and capture it in a spreadsheet. Again, this is going to eliminate any kind of data, hand data entry errors for us. And then after we're done uh, binking in a batch, we can provide the return method the date returned, and then a unique batch ID for each one. So once we have our batch scanned and binked, excuse me, binked, then we're going to save our spreadsheet, and we're going to run the ballot batch update workflow. The ballot batch update workflow would then go through the records within our repository and check for updates in that spreadsheet that we just set up. If a record was found, a match was found, it would then evaluate the ballot one date return field. And again, just on the previous one, uh, similar to the ballot one number field, if there was something in the ballot one date return field, it would actually just move that entry to the for review folder. And if there, not, if there was not entry, if it was empty, then it would update these fields that you see here on the bottom. And we would get the date it was returned, how it was returned to us, and then we would also capture the batch ID. After that uh, workflow had completed, we would evaluate any of the records in the for review folder. Um, there might have been a situation where we had mailed out the ballot to the person. An example is a, we mail the ballot out to the person. In the meantime, after we've mailed it, they call us a day later and say, I'm going to be in Long Beach during the election. I want to, you know, can you, they request an absentee ballot to be mailed to them in Long Beach. And so before we issue that absentee ballot to them, we're going to first go in and spoil that first mail ballot to them. So now the ballot one number fields are updated with the spoiled information. Ballot two is going to reflect the absentee ballot that we just mailed out to Long Beach. And then it might be, oh, go ahead. Sorry. These uh, spreadsheets that you're querying, are these saved just in those fish or they have a server? Do they set up a for us? We, we just save them on our LaserFish server. So they're available for the workflows to. To, to, to search within the spreadsheet for, oh, it's just a, it's just a lookup. The workflow actually performs a lookup in, in the spreadsheet. I think it's based on voter ID, is that? Yeah. yeah. It just tries to find a match on the voter ID is what it is based on. And the mean, so we, now I've mailed the ballot. We've spoiled the first ballot. We've mailed one to Long Beach. The guy is still on Aspen. He decides he's just going to vote this mailed ballot he just received. So then he walks back into us and, and drops off this ballot. And so this would be a scenario where once we're running the batch update, it would notify us that, hey, we've, you've spoiled that ballot one. You need to take a closer look at this. And so that would require some additional processing on our side to go in and do some evaluation and determine what happened. and. Again, we're only going to capture that first ballot we receive back. If you're trying to vote multiple ballots, this allows us to, to manage that. We utilize a save search after this is done to generate, to pull the data that allows us to print out our batch sheets, again, that will follow the batches as they're, they're evaluated by our judges. The ability to Define and save searches was, was really huge as far as helping us out operationally. Um, again, as Linda mentioned earlier, you know, every morning 
we would have five to ten people asking us for different information reports that we would have to respond to and just having the ability to have that you know we could tell them it was going to take us two hours but it really took us like five minutes at the most because we could just pull up a safe search and run it so but we don't need to tell them that so <laughs> But with safe searches, we were allowed to do some really complex reporting. Um, we could evaluate, you know, ballots received by the type within a date range. For a particular type of ballots, we could really evaluate the status of those ballots. How many had been batched? How many had been accepted? Um, how many had issues that we needed to make sure we dealt with? And then how many had been returned undeliverable? And then there were also uh, cases where we would also use safe searches for quality control. We could then run some searches to make sure that the judges had been putting in correct and complete information, and we would have used those to identify training opportunities to go back out to the judges and say, hey, I noticed that you put in, a, I think you put in a wrong date here, and we could help them correct that and then use that as a training opportunity for our judges. And then what you see on the right here is just an example of a safe search that we have to identify ballots returned. And I didn't want to type this in every day, so having the ability to save that off was, was a great help to us. So. so now that our system is implemented, we have the data loaded, we've got our mail ballot information in there, it's time to train our judges. Um, and these are judges that are not always comfortable using computers. So, and it's also important to note that our judges need to be comfortable with, with um, looking and evaluating a lot of complex processes. They need to be able to look at the voter registration data and evaluate that to determine what's going on. Did this voter move? Did they change their name? Is it a junior versus a senior? They need to be able to look at the ballot data to determine, oh, we did mail you a ballot, sir. You know, can you give it three more days to arrive, to arrive or something like that? So they also have to be aware of the election calendar that the state provides to us as far as who can do what when, uh, what actions a voter can take. There's also operating pr principles for the vote center on how to handle different scenarios within the vote centers. And again, we always have new modified statute and rules that the judges need to be aware of each year. And now we're throwing a new system at the judges on top of that. So there's a lot for them to, to take in and, you know, uh, to, to uh, absorb and, and to be able to function as our judges. So it, it really is a difficult job. If you ever have a chance or an opportunity to, to do it as a judge, I highly recommend it. You'd have a, a huge appreciation of what those guys go through to, to make a, an election happen. And then if any of you have ever been involved with an election, you know there's always those unknowns. You're always going to get a few curveballs thrown at you. Things you never would have expected to happen will always happen that you have to deal with. So our overall approach for their training was to keep it simple and keep it realistic, um, provide a simple interface for them, provide them realistic training scenarios so that they are comfortable when they are judges of how to handle the situations as they occur, go over how to review troubleshooting methods, how to make sure that they have the right voter and not the junior or the senior, and how to find a, perhaps a woman who was just married and has changed her name. Um, you're not going to find her on her old name. You're going to have to find her in a new name. Um, it might also be helping out about processing judges on, you know, for some reason some families are sit down at a table to vote and for some reason they all switch ballots. So you have to evaluate when you're getting a ballot back, the number doesn't match. So you might do some investigation and realize that, you know, maybe the husband and wife has switched ballots and they've returned each, they voted and returned each other. So. You have to teach them how to troubleshoot that and use the system to figure that out. The other thing that we think works well is we, have the, we train them in pairs and so they can kind of bounce off each other and make sure that their training methods and how they use the system is very consistent. So again, in keeping it simple, if we, if we look at just the browser that we set up for the judges to use, we have very limited set of tool commands at the top. It's only what they need. And then we also keep the columns that we display very um, simple at first, just to make sure, to help them make sure they know that they have the right voter at the right time. The other thing with the security is that we were able to limit the repository access. When we were doing training, the only repository they could see was the training. Once the training was over, we turn that off, and the only repository they can see is the production or the live voting system. 
And then we were actually able to set the judges up so they couldn't delete anything. And this was actually a comfort to them because as being a little bit older and not comfortable with PCs, they're really afraid if they like double click or something on a record, they're afraid they're just gonna delete it. So, <laughs> so being able to just not have them do any deletions was actually a big help in training them. And then again on the search, we utilized the basic search and trained all the judges to use that. Um, they could use that to search name, address, and date of birth. And again, that was very helpful for them to only have one method of going in and searching for the system, uh, for the voter, excuse me. And then eventually, if we did have some savvy judges, we were able to show them how to use some of the more advanced search features. I do want to note here that, too, though, it's for our ballot processing judges, it was helpful for them to be able to see the multiple images um, that would show up easily. Some of them had used the state system before, and it is a little clunky. You have to go in and out of quite a few screens to be able to view multiple signatures in that system. So they really appreciated and really enjoyed using the simple interface that we were able to give them with this. Pardon? No, they're volunteers. Well, they get paid volunteers. They're paid <laughs> volunteers. They get paid a minimal amount. We possibly could, and I've thought about that um, for this election because of this, the short time frame. Um, we wanted to get it solid and in place, and keeping it simple for us, and with, within just having four weeks was crucial to us. So, you know, looking forward, there's some wonderful opportunities for us, to, I think, to take advantage of. Yeah, we have the county, and mm -hmm. our data, we publish, we publish. Mm -hmm. so we have a certain mm -hmm. public Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Just the web link. Good question. Sure. How do you generate your demo data? Do you do it all automatically or is it all manually? Um, I actually set that up all manually. Okay. It took a little while, but it was beneficial to have it. Um, yeah, that's what we used for the training as well. Our training yeah. data was the demo data. Sure. Okay. It's a lot of superheroes. <laughs> Cartoon characters, so. <laughs> Are you folks collecting these signatures uh, uh, electronically as well? Are you doing that yet? Or that Not yet. Not yet. We, have, we would like to do it. That's one of the, the opportunities. Um, we're looking at actually utilizing quick fields to help us capture that from those return ballots. So the people who typically return the ballots, that's the, definitely the ones that we want to capture. So. And anything about the smartphone kind of? Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Right. And you know, this, this also gives opportunity for us to potentially give information back to the voter, but we need to be, you know, we just need to be careful about how we approach that, you know. The state will now let you track your ballot um, if you wanted to go in and see how things, from, and, you know, this potentially has that opportunity as well, so we just have to kind of think it through and make sure it's secure access. And So if people wanted to track their status of their ballot, they could, so it's, it's possible. Um, Opportunities for the future. Again, we're talking about using quick fields to scan and save signatures. We want to look at using forms to for help us add the new voter or update voter. This would be allow us to just add additional validation when that, when that information is getting updated. And then also using forms and workflow to include additional signatures for a voter or, and or additional information. If we do have that absentee registration, that should just be captured along with the voter record. But we're also looking at utilizing just the, the information data in other ways. Um, it can help us with jury selection. It can also help us verify initiatives and referendum petitions. And, and then it's, we're also looking at it to help us with the city food tax rebate applications that we do every year, which, are, which is based on being a registered voter within the city. So, so at this time, we're going to take some questions, but right before we do that, Linda and I wanted to give special thanks to a couple other people who really made this a success for us, help us make this a, a success. One is Ruth Kinney. Stand up, Ruth, real quick. <laughs> 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 
Ruth works in our IT department, and she helps me make sure everything's secure and locked down and ready to go. And, and then the other person we want to recognize is Jen Harris. You have to stand up real quick. <laughs> Jen is our VAR. <laughs> And once we got past your crazy Cindy and Linda, then we got we were able to get through the workflows and, and got it done. So we really, you know, really appreciate you guys helping us out. Okay. Thanks. So at this time, if you guys have any questions, be happy to take those. So you do um, your whole process this way because you don't use the outside like automated election. It's all internal. It is. It is. And and again, once we we really talked to a lot of vendors and. And even there's a lot of actually cities that will use a county to run their election. Um, and we're not one of those cities. We actually run our own elections. And so we, we needed our own system in the state. The state of Colorado currently does not allow municipalities to utilize their registration system. Even though we're supposed to run our election based on that system, we don't have access to it. So we can get the data from the county, which is nice. But we, had, we just don't really have a system that allows us to do that. And with, you know, elections is really evolving with the mail ballots, you know, and to me within, it's not too far in the future where everything's going to be really electronic. I mean, they're doing a lot of with the, the electronic now with the, the UOCAVA voters and the overseas voters um, getting those email ballots already as, long as, as well as our special absentees. We actually email a ballot out to them and they email it back to us. They sign an affidavit knowing that they're using potentially unsecured methods of returning that, but they do it now, so. Any other questions? So th this seems like it's very successful. Uh, can the county look at your solution, perhaps, you know, make, make do what y'all have done for their, for their our, our county is uh, special. <laughs> the, <laughs> our counties have to use systems that are certified by the Secretary of State's department, Secretary of State's office. So um, unfortunately, they, they wouldn't even be able to use our solution if they liked it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so well, they're unless, in a unless the state yeah would. unless the state went through a uh, process of of certifying it. You know, they, it would have to be certified by the Secretary of State's office. So um, you know, we kind of took it and ran with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as far as the solution. Um, went but you know our county would not you know be able to use it as a solution you mentioned there's other cities in the county that let the county do your election mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have those cities looked to y'all to think that maybe they could we had one city briefly look at it but they were in a even tighter time frame than than we were you know they currently use laser fish but they i mean their election was like weeks away that needed to do it but uh, you know, we really think, especially for municipalities that are home rule and not statutory, that don't have the strict you know, guidelines of the Secretary of State's office, that this is something that they could really um, utilize. Well, um, the counties, like I said, especially in Colorado, have to follow the Secretary of State guidelines. And use the and use the registration system. But there's a lot of municipalities that you know even up till now, they're just now taking on mail ballot. They're just now taking on uh, the signature verification. You know, so as again as the whole election and the ballot processing evolves at the municipality level, this is something that like we ran into now. It's like a, a paper method using clipboards and and trying to stay up till four in the clock in the morning and keying everything into the master poll sheet, that's just not gonna work anymore for cities. And so, you know, having a, you know, a solution like this is just gonna provide them with an opportunity to take on those a mail ballot, offering mail ballot and, and such. And, and Colorado is actually one of the slowest states to actually adopt and for the voters to adopt mail ballot, but they're getting there. And there's some counties with, I, I know it's reported there's a pretty good turnout, and we're getting that way in Aspen. We're like one of the slowest, Pekin County is one of the slowest ones in Colorado. So, but we're still, what, we're 40% or something like that? Maybe? As far as turnout? As far as mail ballots. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're getting close to the halfway mark, and I, it increases every year. So I think, you know, the adoption there, the, the, you know, it's there to, for people to use mail ballots. I think people will appreciate that and like that opportunity. So it's just, you know, having something like this, 
it's flexible, it's going to allow us to, to take on those changes. Mm -hmm. I would suggest, where I, I, I'm guessing that, has anybody challenged? You know, there's always challenges in your way. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now, that you, now that you have all of this documented, mm -hmm. it's not easier to, you know, when these people, when folks do challenge, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, show. we can show things and um, we can show them the, you know, how audits, how we capture the audit information. Uh, but some of our judges are actually, some of the, we, we actually invite people to be judges who we know are going to challenge us. Come on in, be a judge, work with us. Mm -hmm. They work with us, they become very comfortable with the systems that we use, and we didn't, we didn't really have any yeah. pushback this year. No, and some of our most challenging citizens who caused the biggest ruckus liked the system the best. You know, they were our biggest advocates saying it was one of the best systems they had worked with. The signature yeah. thing is a really big thing in Aspen. in Aspen. It's huge. Because with a lot of the people receive their ballot in a um, post office box, and a lot of people take their ballots and just dump them in the trash. And so people are, some people are freaked out that somebody's going to go in the trash and load all those ballots. So that's one thing. So again, the signature verification is makes it pretty solid. So any other questions? Or? I'll just say <clears throat> your experience is fantastic. And it's hard for us to say that it was great. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see that you could lead your area of the state if not the country mm -hmm. on other initiatives using the license issues and that's why you know, this is driven by your your council, etc. board. Uh, there could be other ways where you can say other issues. <laughs> you could have this whole theory of, of uh, letting uh, citizens uh, have a say on a prescribed day every month mm -hmm. about an issue which they raise and uh, put it out there in a lazy dish form. Where they oh, they would love that. Oh, they just, <laughs> <laughs> they just petition those. They stand mm -hmm. in front of our local grocery store and petition it. That's what they do in Aspen. <laughs> <laughs> They're very active, so. <laughs> and it ends up in laser fish eventually, because then I have to verify all those signatures that they gathered. No. So. <laughs> but you're talking more like just um, a survey. Just a way of capturing like a survey. Yeah. Yeah. We would need a new department, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Are you interested in relocating, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> another, locality, another locality referred to uh, the folks that have the CABE people, the CAVE people, citizens and, again, virtually everything. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you might have a few that would love to vote on every day. <laughs> Yes, we would. We do have some. All, all of them. We've been very active set of cave people. <laughs> so, well, any, other, any other questions? We're just about to, or our hour in. So, thank you so, very much. Yeah. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you.